So getting starting with our afternoon sessions. Our afternoon sessions uh, focus on the future of Louisiana's relationship with water. Beginning with our first session of the afternoon entitled Contestations Over Water, we again jump into the discourse over Louisianans' tumultuous history with water, this time from the perspective of the legal, political, and policy decisions that make up our understanding of our relationship with water. The panelists for this session include Frederick Gordon, who is the chair of the Department of Politics, Philosophy, and Public Administration and MPA director of Columbus State University. Gordon holds his doctorate from the University of Southern California in political science and a master's in public and international affairs with a specialization in international political economy from the University of Pittsburgh. He is the author of Freshwater Resources and Interstate Cooperation, uh, published out of SUNY uh, in 2008, and International Environmental Justice Competing Claims and Perspectives, uh, 2012. His presentation topic today is The Making and Breaking of the Presidency, the 1927 Mississippi River Flood. Following him is going to be Scott Hemmerling, who is the Director of Human Dimensions for the Water Institute of the Gulf, uh, focusing on research related to climate adaptation and community resilience. He has more than 15 years of experience investigating anthropogenic alterations to the landscape and the impacts of development on coastal communities. Hemmerling's recent work with the Water Institute is focused on analyzing the societal impacts of environmental change in coastal Louisiana and developing methods to examine the linkages between human and natural systems. He is the principal investigator on the Louisiana Coastal Atlas Project, a geographical study examining the effects of historical, social, economic, and environmental stresses on community resilience. He is also working on several projects to develop methodological approaches for measuring socioeconomic changes in coastal communities. This includes a societal or social impact assessment methodology for coastal restoration projects and a human systems monitoring plan as part of the Louisiana's system-wide assessment and monitoring program. Dr. Hemmerling also developed a statewide comprehensive water resources assessment that quantified the sustainability of both groundwater and surface water resources for current and future societal needs. Most recently, Dr. Hemmerling developed approaches to incorporate local knowledge into assessments of community resilience and the social value of ecosystem restoration projects. Uh, following uh, Scott Hammerling is going to be a dual presentation uh, by both Warren Perrin and Gordon Shuffler. So Warren Perrin is an attorney with the Lafayette firm of Perrin, Landry, and Delaunay, and a skills professor at Loyola Law School in New Orleans. From 1994 to 2010, he was a president of Cotafil, a member of the board of directors of the Congrès Mondial Acadien, Louisiana, 1999, president of the Lieutenant Governor's Task Force of Franco Fett, uh, and the founder of Acadian Museum of Erath, Louisiana. In 1999, he was awarded the French National Order of Merit Award and the Université Santa Anne uh, in Canada gave him an honorary Doctor of Laws degree. Perrin is the author of eight books. His latest book, Acadie, Then and Now, A People's History, was the 2015 winner of the Le Prix uh, France Acadie. Uh, in 2007, he was inducted into the Louisiana Justice Hall of Fame. In, in 2012, he was named chairman of the Francophone section of the Louisiana State Bar Association. Joining um, Mr. Perrin is Gordon Shuffler, uh, uh, who is a Lafayette attorney practicing in areas of tort, maritime, and environmental law for the past 13 years. He is a native of Lafayette and a graduate of UL Lafayette, uh, obtaining a law degree from Loyola University and New Orleans College of Law in 2004. Uh, Shuffler has represented both parties uh, in both state and federal courts in cases involving water bottoms laws and issues in a variety of settings. Aside from his legal practice um, as an avid sportsman and outdoorsman, uh, Shuffler has been a student of Louisiana water issues all of his life. Uh, please join me in welcoming our first panelist, uh, Frederick Gordon. Okay, well, good afternoon everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. I've come from Georgia and uh, 
as you can see, uh, there's something over there that says River Politics, because that's how I got connected to the Water Conference over here. Um, I teach a course in, in, uh, in Georgia, Columbus State, on river politics. And in that class, we look at our different water issues. Like you have a lot of the main water concerns here in management. Uh, there's a lot of issues pervasive, probably throughout many states. And I started off looking at um, a very complex issue in Georgia or between Georgia, Alabama, and Florida and sharing a border or the Chattahoochee River. Um, which spans from North Atlanta all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, about 380 miles in total. And it's important, and it certainly I focused my course in that respect because I wanted students to be privy to the germane issues to the locale. But I ultimately increased my research and increased my course capacity oh, and focused, um, I actually, because I went to school at Southern Cal, I, I focused on the Los Angeles case study and then I added on to the Colorado River and even the Ogallala Aquifer on water issues. Water issues are, per, are pervasive. But one of the things I, I, I didn't think, uh, or I started to recognize was the issue of the Mississippi. And uh, the biggest river in the United States and certainly the tremendous history. And so I wanted, us, I wanted to do research in that kind of context. And ultimately my focus for my research area uh, extends uh, looking at environmental policy and also linkage to the presidency. And so that is really how I want to uh, offer a presentation to you today so that you can have some perspective. And I use a historical paradigm, uh, uh, a public administration paradigm, and um, ultimately try to leave you with some interesting perspectives. So one of the questions to consider is that obviously about environmental policy. And yes, the Mississippi River plays an important role. Uh, those who've read John Barry's Rising Tide or uh, have studied the Mississippi will realize that it had a tremendous role in shaping a presidency. And that's one of the things that I wanted to explore with you today. So one of the things to consider though is that, let's take a step back for a second. Obviously we're immersed in our river policies and in our river concerns and so forth, but recognize this much. We think about water in terms of regulatory behavior. We think about water in terms of navigation or commercial or energy uh, source and so forth. But in terms of the environment, we don't have a national, we don't have a cabinet position. Uh, there's no environmental amendments. And ultimately, at the same time, I believe that the presidency and the environment are inextricably linked. And so that's one of the things for us to consider here. Um, obviously, it's not just simply the Mississippi, a little uh, background history would dictate to us that other presidents have been involved with, president, with uh, environmental matters. For example, certainly we link back to President Roosevelt, uh, we could see the creation of the Bureau of Reclamation, we could see the establishment of the Forest Service. All these things are actually uh, certainly connected to a conservation policy, certainly connected to uh, executive behavior. Um, obviously, we see later on uh, conservation, their politics were involved, and certainly we far, had the Forest Service, Gibbert Pinchot uh, was there, but ultimately the presidents can make, they can break environmental policy. In this case, he actually was, uh, lost his position, uh, fire, ultimately fired by, Pinchot was ultimately fired by President Taft. What I think for us to consider here is obviously that environmental policy as a whole can shape the presidency and ultimately challenges to our, what we call a neo-administrative state and our case study, the Mississippi flood of 1927. So one of the things that may, I realize not everybody's, I've seen a lot of fantastic presentations here towards water and uh, one of the things to consider is, well, what is the neo-administrative state? It's important variable because ultimately it dictates a little bit about how policy is created. And so when we think about neo administrative state, what we're really suggesting is bureaucracy. Uh, for a long period of time, it really was kind of amorphous in the United States. Why? Because ultimately a lot of things are predicated under uh, loose regulatory perspectives. So there really wasn't a clear national established bureaucracy, certainly up to the beginning of the 20th century. It's very limited, it's haphazard. Um, what we do see with public administration coming into the field, uh, we start to see different waves and phases of this. And one of the things to think about is that at uh, the beginning, certainly the beginning of the Roosevelt administration, we started to see progressive period where, where it was an uh, aggressive idea of government holding more responsibility. 
uh, in terms of uh, for uh, more accountable to the public in incremental standards of, 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 at that point. We see a element of centralization uh, then, which went with centralization meant that environmental policy or, bureau or uh, bureaucratic decisions were more controlled at the executive branch. Then we see a pushback. We see a pushback and obviously we see the administrative state and obviously uh, a new term called the neo-administrative state. Now in simple context, what that just simply means is that by the FDR period, we start to see uh, extensive elements of uh, governmental agencies start to dot the uh, political landscape. Um, and that's where we see uh, uh, a very much of a decentralized process and so too the neo-administrative state, which would include agencies like the EPA, but uh, ultimately we see a lot of power being given to uh, these administrative agencies. So what about the connection to the president and to the Mississippi, and the, obviously to the flood? Well, one of the things you have to consider is that with the variable of the administrative agencies having a lot of power in dictating policy, that is an important consideration. But what um, ultimately we want to think about too is the connection to the Mississippi, uh, to the Great Flood and so forth. And we'll see how that variable could be impacted. Obviously, this is an area when studying or looking at river policy is incredible because of all the different, the, the impact was, was immense, it was vast, uh, it was quite extensive. In fact, it, people from all groups, all, all races and so forth. But one of the things to consider is that it also was inherently linked to the presidency. And so what we see here is that the, the impact and um, we see obviously when you see, I've heard beforehand, when you have, when you ha there's a problem, sometimes there can be termed opportunities. Now, in this race, in this, um, um, in this case, obviously there are a lot of people who were very much harmed by the, by the flood. I think uh, there's environmental justice concerns. So African Americans, we had a, people had to live for lengthy times in relief camps. And this became a big question mark. And obviously there are a lot of other issues that as I, coming not from Louisiana, from Georgia, learning about St. Bernard and the Plaquemines Parish and how the waters are, were diverted, say, New Orleans and so forth. What I think is important, too, is with that type of crisis, it also created a nexus to the presidency. And a lot of people um, may not make that connection, but I think that's one of the things we want to think about here. And so in the simplest of ways to look at it is that there was a uh, uh, Herbert Hoover was important for this period of time. He was known as a great engineer, and obviously he was important in helping or providing relief as a Secretary of Commerce under uh, President Calvin Coolidge. This is important because he ultimately uh, was, in many ways, respects lauded for handling of the refugee camps, and he made promises to the African American community, which uh, ultimately, uh, at the beginning, were thought were going to be very beneficial, not fully fulfilled. And I think this is linking to the presidency. And this is really where my research is, is where I wanted to, to connect to. Uh, obviously, um, what we see here is that there were some immeasurable impacts here. Following the Great Flood, we see the Army Corps of Engineers come into play. Uh, we also see the Flood Control Act, obviously promoting the world's longest system of levees. But going back to, uh, to the to the Mississippi flood. We know the extensive nature of what, uh, of what flooding can do and so forth, and it created a political aperture, a political opening to provide hope and opportunity, and ultimately it had a great impact in the 1928 election, helping propel Hoover into office, but he was not able to uh, promote or to extend uh, in many respects to continue that. And so a lot of times, in many respects, uh, his idea of taking sharecroppers to making them landowners became part of the, uh, a challenge here. And so what I wanted to do here uh, is just to share with you, obviously, the election process here. And so I guess you can see it as clear, but you can see the, from an election standpoint, uh, obviously, in, by 28, we see the South is democratic and so forth, uh, but the rest of the country is not. And so uh, ultimately, that changes a lot considerably, this is another angle towards it. Um, but what you see here is that um, the, obviously from an election standpoint, you see uh, Hoover will win the election, and but ultimately by the 32 election, 
things have changed. So why or how does the Mississippi flood integrate into that? Well, it's important because ultimately it created a political opportunity starting to propel somebody, propel Hoover into office, and then ultimately it became an issue, particularly in 32. Now, this is not the only reason for him to not to win the election or be reelected. Of course, the Great Depression stood right in our, in our midst. But what I think is important is that you do have a recognition that uh, environmental factors can impact the presidency. And obviously, this is just something that I thought uh, just to share that with you, that some of the, ang the, the pr perspectives. A lot of the reason for, for what happened here was that the Democrats were able to shift in terms of policy perspective, and, and Roosevelt was able to extend or broaden the opportunities or the connection for people to join the Democratic Party. But I think it's really important here um, is, to, is, is for you to consider the, the idea is that the presidency can play an important role. And certainly environmental factors can play a, a critical issue. Um, the flood is important. There's no mistaking about it. There's no gainsaying to suggest that a flood uh, certainly led or gave an opportunity to somebody to be able to uh, see, seize the chance, seize the, the, that perspective to be able to advance political ambitions. So we, this is just a real quick perspective here. But what I wanted us to do is to take it back to today and try to see if we could tie it in back to the initial perspective to, uh, to the uh, administrative state. Um, one of the things to consider here uh, as a whole is that in today's context, well, to go back for a second is that you should recognize um, that at that period of time, we could see how environmental policy could impact an executive branch. But in so too, it also suggests that in many respects that the administrative state or the bureaucracy, could that be impacted? And so what I wanted us to think about here uh, as a whole is to consider that the, uh, today's context, environment still plays an important role. We see it uh, in this today, in today's perspective, we see issues in terms of, well, climate change and ultimately the impact with that and certainly how that also plays a role in terms of, or certainly uh, in connection to the presidency. And so what I'm trying to get us to think about here is that in one hand, we have the idea of the administrative state, which is an important bureaucratic function today, uh, always has been. At the same time, we also need to think about uh, in terms of the presidency actually shaping the environment and so too the environment shaping the presidency. So in the simplest of ways to look at it, just think of it like this, that by 1928, certainly the flood played an important role. Uh, by 1932, the flood also played an essential role. And if we flash forward today, we can also see uh, the importance that environmental policy can help. I wouldn't go as far as saying shaping a presidency, but it certainly does show that the president has an impact, certainly can a big impact in terms of environmental policy. And that's perhaps one of the things that uh, it's a, we're learning about today. And in terms of the neo-administrative state, the argument that I'm working on is, the, is to suggest not only that the bureaucracies have an important role in terms of the, uh, shaping regulatory behavior, but it also directly to, from the executive branch, directly from the president, um, the person himself. So that's kind of the framework that I wanted to share with you today and, and at least to offer you some insight, uh, particularly in terms of uh, the, the relationship, and certainly when you have these unusual force majeure type of events, how that can impact not only the public, uh, certainly the local level, but also at the national level as well. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, our next presenter is Scott Hemmerling, and I also want to mention that everybody should make sure their phones are on silent uh, moving forward. I forgot to say that before we got started. So, Scott. Well, good afternoon, and I'd like to thank Liz and the Center for Louisiana Studies for having me here. 
Um, today I'm going to kind of talk in a little bit of a different direction than where we've gone so far with some of the water talk today. A lot of the talk we've gone through has been about flooding and kind of these extreme hazards events. You know, there's, there's issues. Louisiana has too much water, and that's what we talk about, the floods, the rainfalls, bayous, seafood, the Mississippi River. And there's, now there's issues with, you know, for, for years there's been kind of a little bit of back and forth between Texas and Louisiana about water from the Sabine River, and Texas needs this water. Last year there was a, you know, a proposal to pipe water from the Mississippi River through Arkansas, just north of the Louisiana border, over to Texas. So this raises a lot of interesting issues with, when, when it comes to thinking about water. Not all water is the same. We talked about the 2016 floods, and as an example, in the city of New Orleans, there was about 12 inches of rain in the month of August last year. Two months later, in October, there was 0.05 of an inch of water in the city of New Orleans, and they were on the edge of drought conditions. So we've seen kind of this shift from extreme rainfall events to drought, sometimes concurrently. But, and there's local impacts to this. And with climate change, we're gonna see a lot more of this variability and this fluctuation. But there's also questions of environmental flows and ecological needs of our coast. And that's one of the real issues when we think about why does Louisiana need this water? I think Mark Davis from Tulane, I've heard him say often that the state's master plan is really just a plumbing plan for the coast, moving water and sediment from one part of the coast to the other. The master plan relies on sediment to build land, but also the ecological needs of the coast rely on water. So some of the issues we have aren't just related to too much water, it's related to not enough water. So this project that we did for the state of Louisiana for the Department of Natural Resources was really to develop a framework to look at water availability, water needs, and how much water do we have in the coast? And some of this could be useful to decision makers as you know, they try to come up with a water code for the state. Really what you have to do to have a water code is you have to know what we have. And that's really an issue in Louisiana is that we don't know how much groundwater we have, for example. Other states such as Texas, they're required to have groundwater availability models and they can tell you how much water we have. Louisiana, we don't have that requirement. So part of what we did here was really try to develop a framework to measure the sustainability of water. And sustainability, that's the balance between use and supply that causes no further impairment to our resources and maintains or improves the current health of our water systems. So part of what we wanted to do was get a standardized set of measures that would allow us to evaluate on a regional level water supply, setting baseline water budgets. What do we have in terms of groundwater? What do we have in terms of surface water? Looking at inputs and outputs, outputs being for industry or agriculture or whatever you know, public drinking water. And we wanted to make sure that we could really get this into a universal format that we could look at it in other parts of the state and may possibly extend this to other states. And obviously working with data, it's identifying data gaps. So that's part of what we needed to do was see what data are we missing in Louisiana to really be able to, for the lawmakers to set up a water code for the state. So we went through a number of activities with this. The first is developing the framework, reviewing the data. Then we went through a few case study areas, and I'm gonna go over one today for kind of the Lafayette area. But really, how does this framework work and how can we apply it to kind of our regional areas? So the framework really is kind of your, your standard water budget, but we also need to look at this interaction between groundwater and surface water, understanding that some of the water that comes in as rainfall and the flood water doesn't necessarily trickle down and become groundwater. So that's cases where we can see river flooding at the same time that we're seeing drought in other parts of the state. So part of we need to look at the inputs, what goes in. Like I said, direct precipitation, runoff. I think it was mentioned earlier today when Dr. Colton was speaking about as we pave over some of these areas, what we see is this increased runoff Another side of that is we see a decrease of water that goes into the groundwater. But we also have to look at the outputs and the withdrawals, public water, industrial water, agricultural. And again, that goes from kind of at the surface 
with groundwater, and then the deep groundwater. So like I said, we applied the framework to our few different pilot study areas. Southwest Louisiana is where I'm going to focus on today. Estimated surface and groundwater supply and usage then projected future supply and usage with the understanding that with climate change, with population change, what we see today isn't going to continue in the future. We might see some of these trends continue, and some of those, you know, some of those are difficult to determine. So in addition to the Southwest study area, we also looked at the Northwest and the Southeast. You can kind of look at our three overarching areas we looked at here, and we used the Huck 8 hydrological units, and we chose these areas specifically because of a different mix of uses. We have a lot of agriculture, agricultural usage in southwest Louisiana. Rice is the big, biggest example, which as we go through the results, you'll kind of see how using groundwater for rice irrigation really impacts that overall water balance. We also have up in the northwest, up in Shreveport, there was a lot, especially in you know, a few years back with all the fracking going on, and at one point there was a lot of groundwater that was being used for fracking. Then industry got together in the Northwest and decided to try to shift over to surface water and to reduce the impacts on the aquifers up there. And then in Baton Rouge, we obviously have issues with saltwater intrusion due to the refineries pulling a lot of water across a fault line that goes through Baton Rouge, pulling salt water into the groundwater in the city. But for this talk, I'm going to really kind of focus on the eastern portion of the Chico Aquifer, along with the surface water basins, Bayou Teche, the Vermilion River, and the Mermintaw. The one, air, one reason we looked at this area is because there is a mix of demand uses. Agriculture, and like I said, rice is really one of the big water issues in southwest Louisiana, but also livestock industry. And then we have urban area, Lafayette's included in this, but we also have coastal issues. So we have to think about things, how much of the water is actually available next to the coast due to salt water intrusion and kind of salinity levels. So water might not be useful for certain uses depending on the levels of salinity. Now just to give an idea of the estimated demand for fresh water, so there's four hydrologic units that we look at here. And we can see, obviously, the greatest household demand is in the hydrologic unit that contains Lafayette. And that's obviously the most population is going to lead to the most household demand. And just an idea, we use a lot of the existing USGS gauges as our backdrop to really model some of the inputs and what goes in. Now, we had to use for outputs, we used a lot of different data sources. but. We looked at things like base flow, runoff, precipitation, groundwater recharge, evapotranspiration. We also adapted it to look at this kind of deep aquifer recharge. The recharge areas for our groundwater are actually in the northwestern corner of that area. So even if we get a lot of rainfall across these hydrologic units, most of that's not going to recharge our aquifers. So when we look at the overall water balance in these four hydrologic units, and this is groundwater and surface water combined, we see when you talk about rainfall and how much water comes into the system, we see a lot more water coming into the system overall than is being withdrawn. Some really large proportions of it. A lot of that obviously goes out into the Gulf and goes out through our surface water. And when we think about surface water and we, and we look here, these percentages are based on the surface water. So we are getting a lot more water coming in, being fed from the bayous, from the rivers, from the streams up north, coming down into these areas. And we can see a lot of that surface water when we talk about the outputs, a lot of that is power usage. So some of that is actually returned as return flows, where they pull it in, they use it for cooling water, and then send it back into the surface water. But that's just one part of the story. And really, when we start thinking about water scarcity in Louisiana, and that really a lot of people don't think about water scarcity issues, but where that comes into play is when we think about groundwater. Now, if we look at the percentages here, we look at Mermintah headwaters and the Mermintah hydrologic units, we can see, especially Mermintah headwaters, 469% more water is being withdrawn from groundwater than is being resupplied. And a lot of that, if we look at the graph here, we see a lot of that is from rice. 
the rice, we're irrigating the fields from the groundwater, pulling the groundwater up. And a lot of that is the, the surface water is generally a high salinity level, can't be used for rice. So we kind of have that issue there. So when we're thinking about the different ways waters are waters used in the state, we have to start considering things like salinity. Salinity can't be used for rice. Now there are cases where they're diverting some fresh water into some of the waterways, and then those waterways can be used to irrigate the rice. Now I'll mention when, when we presented this to the Water Resources Commission, and one of the representatives from you know, a rice farmer came up and spoke with us after. He said, you know, we really see ourselves as borrowers of water. You know, we, we use this water, we take it, but then we return it, we drain our fields. Well, that is, that is very much true, but they're pulling water out of the groundwater and then putting it into the surface water, which creates, it doesn't do anything to help that kind of, that imbalance that we see with the, with the agricultural yields and how much is being pulled out here. And I mentioned before, if we look at salinity line, so we look here in some of these, some of the Huck 8s, over 50% of the Huck 8 is actually, has high levels of salinity and can't be used for drinking water, for example. So when we start thinking of how much water is actually available for use, and we pull out some of these quality impacts and these constraints, and also clean water, the water's listed as impaired under the Clean Water Act. How much, what percentage of those waters would be pulled out? Now I will mention that there's, you know, different uses of water. If, if you're looking at the level of oxygen in the water and that's low, that's obviously very bad for the ecology of an area. That water could be used, however, for power, you know, for power plants or other industrial uses. So we have to really start thinking about different ways that water can be used across the state and understanding that there are differences in quality and quantity that these different sectors need. Now one thing we also have to think about is population growth. Now the maps here show estimated pop urbanization from 2020 to 2060, so over a 40 year growth. The area in red is area that is modeled to grow, to as cities kind of sprawl out and spread. But we also have population growth that goes with that. I think a lot of times when we think about population growth, we really just tend to think of the numbers. If, the, if we have this many people coming in, then that's gonna have this much impact on the water. But we also have to think about you know, the population isn't gonna grow straight up unless you're in a really dense urban center. It's gonna sprawl out. So we're actually gonna have kind of this dual impact where you have people using more, more people using more water, but you're also gonna have less water going into the groundwater because of, pay, of being paved and impervious surface created. So as we create this impervious surface, we're gonna see more water run off into the surface water, less go into the groundwater. Now overall though, when we look at kind of inputs and outputs, the top table shows the inputs. We are gonna see less water making it into our groundwater. The second column, but it's, you know, one per, minus 1%, one minus 0.1, so a very minor change to what the inputs into that system are. The bottom table shows the outputs. So with that population growth, and the Vermilion hydrologic unit is the one that contains Lafayette. So that's where we're gonna see the most growth. And just based on current usage, we're gonna assume about 5.5% more water is going to be used because of the population growth. Now one thing we also have to consider, kind of in conclusion when we think about the water and how much we're using is cost, energy cost, because ultimately that's gonna be one of the major constraints. Whether it's treating water, whether it's desal desalinization of the water, or just as water levels drop, it's gonna cost more to pull it to the surface. So that's another thing we have to think about is that kind of embedded energy that's in the water. How much water does it take to, or how much energy does it take 
to pull the water up, to treat it, and to transport it. Because ultimately, the economics of it is what's going to drive a lot of the water issues in the future. And as we can see here, the annual energy used in Lafayette, you know, the total energy consumed to pull the water up, total energy cost to withdraw from domestic wells. So even an individual who has their own domestic well, as the water levels drop, there's going to be an increased energy cost for them to pull the water up. And again, this was just one of the case study areas that we looked at. And, but what we did with this framework was we really developed a way to assess water supply and demand at a scale that's usable statewide. Obviously, as we saw here, there's to, we really need to start thinking local levels. So that's kind of one of the ways we have to think in the future is look at crop-specific water usage, for example. We know that rice agriculture, which they call out specifically in some of the USGS data, but other crops also use differential amounts of water. And what we did, we tested this in areas with available data and used existing studies for comparison. And we made sure that the framework that we developed was modular. As better data becomes available, we can take the data that we had in here and we can replace it and make sure that into the future, as more studies are done, if we add groundwater availability models, we can use those. We can get the model will improve as the data improves. So kind of the technical path forward is really, it, it's gonna require a collaborative and coordinated effort to really get a good grip of how much water we have in the state and the water usage. And as I mentioned before, we need to really start thinking about, you know, getting down to the HUC 12, kind of these smaller levels. The HUC 8 level is good to give us a kind of overall view from a statewide level, but to really get to some of these local impacts and get to kind of a policy relevant scale, we have to break it down into even smaller areas. And we also have to go from annual means, which we use here, to seasonal means, because there is a different agricultural season. You know, a lot more water is used at different parts of the year, and you know, at the non-agricultural season, you're not using as much. And like I said, we need to refine these tools. The groundwater availability models are a big thing. Even for what we did here, we gave did our best estimate with existing data, but we really need some really good, fine-grained high groundwater availability models because we need to know how much water we have here because it's gonna be difficult to be able to plan for the future without really getting the most accurate accounting of what we have now. So the future, right now, the Tulane Center for Water Law and Policy are leading kind of a consortium of, to develop a water code. And part of what they're looking for is, like we said, the groundwater availability model. They're using the framework that we have and then trying to really fine grain it and how can we turn this into policy. We need to do multi-scale studies, regional, but also expanding out, Louisiana, Texas, really getting a good understanding of water needs in other areas. And I mentioned Texas needing our water. Well, we need it for our environmental flows, but what is the best use of water? And that's ultimately what the decision is gonna be made on and who gets the water is what is the best use. And in some cases, human consumption, you know, if we don't have accurate modeling showing our environmental need for it, the need for our coast, then that drinking water that Texas needs it for will be the deciding factor. With that, I'd like to acknowledge the funding for this came from the DNR Office of Conservation and Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. We also prepared this study in coordination with our technical coordination team, David Borak from ULL, Charlie Demas, who is with USGS, Gary Hansen from LSU Shreveport, and John Loveless and Pierre Sargent, also from USGS. Thank you. Uh, our next presenters are Warren Perrin and Gordon Shuffler, and they actually have a handout uh, of their presentation, so I'm gonna walk around and pass them out uh, while they get started. So.
Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Garden and I have launched a, an interesting lawsuit. The term we use is sui generis. It's never been challenged the way we're challenging the state's ability to take private property and claim not only ownership of lands, but also the minerals that the lands would normally produce and the money paid to the landowner. But uh, I will give a broad brush overview of the law in this area, and uh, Garden will put flesh on the bones. In the 16th century, there were French men and women living in the Loire Valley, and they made a living by harvesting salt from the sea. So they had acquired a unique knowledge of dealing with the tides. These people were granted permission to settle North America, the first people to settle in the colony Acadie, which is now Nova Scotia. And they became known as Acadians. When they got there, they were there in 1604, and they made friends with the Mi'kmaq Native Americans who showed them methods of using their already known skills of the tides. And by the way, this area in Nova Scotia has the highest tides in the world. At one point, it's 84 feet tides. And rather than cut trees and move rocks like the pilgrims did for farmland, the Acadians built the Abwato dike system and reclaimed land from the coastal marshes. And today, it's still the most productive lands in Canada. So, Fast forward to 1720. The Acadians have been there now about 120 years. And a young teenage girl named Agnes Thibodeau marries Joseph Beausoleil Broussard. And they settle in a little village on the Petticodiac River near Moncton, New Brunswick today. In 1755, the grandchildren of the pilgrims who had been haters of the Acadians, who were Catholic, decided to seize the lands from them, and that's called the Grand Derangement. So Agnes Thibodeau lost her lands. She was imprisoned, and Agnes died in a prison camp in George's Island in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Her husband, Beausoleil, led the first boatload of Acadians to Louisiana, in 1765, and they migrated naturally to the coastal marshes of South Louisiana. And Agnes and Beausoleil were my eighth generation ancestors. I'm from Southern Vermilion Parish on the border of Iberia Parish, just north of Vermilion Bay. Now we're gonna talk about Napoleon Bonaparte and the Civil Code of Louisiana, and how this all ties together. History is repeating itself because today, the state of Louisiana is again taking away from the Thibodeau family lands that they settled and purchased following the Civil War in Southern Vermilion Parish. And Garden and Nye's lawsuit seeks to challenge the state's ability to do that. The state is relying upon two articles of the Napoleonic Civil Code. For those of you who aren't from Louisiana, Louisiana is the only state in the United States that adopted the French Napoleonic Civil Code. Every other state has the British common law. It was probably Napoleon's greatest work, greatest lasting good work. And what the code was, was to attempt to write down a law to provide for every possible situation. But Napoleon, being the emperor, did not want to have the lords of the manor prevent any of his sailing warships from going anywhere they choose to go. So by, by writing Article 450, he cleverly crafted a method by which determined who owned water bottoms. That article says, on the highest tide, the winter solstice in France, on that day, the high tide mark, everything below it belongs 
to the emperor. And we accepted that as part of Louisiana's laws. And nobody gave it a second thought. Who cared about the marshes? You trapped rats, you killed a few alligators, and that was about it. But the Thibodeaux developed a new farming method with cattle. Before you had the mechanization, they would bring their cattle on barges in the marsh and fatten them up during the winter on marsh grass, which were the temperate temperatures they wouldn't die as the grass on the prairies died. And they got rich doing that, selling cattle to New Orleans, crossing the Atchafalaya Basin. And I love to tell the story that a, a hundred years before the Chisholm Trail, where all the cowboy movies were made, a hundred years before that, the real cowboys were the Acadians bringing the cattle to New Orleans that got fat in the marshes of South Louisiana. So they discover oil on the Thibodeau property, 240 acres. And unbeknownst to the Thibodeaux, the state is told by PetroQuest, the driller of the well, I got good news, state of Louisiana. 40 of the acres is underwater, in our opinion. And therefore, we're going to send the mineral royalty check to the state treasury instead of to the Thibodeau people in Delcom, Abbeville, Erath, Bayou Tig, and Boston. And the family would have never known about it had not a member of the state land office, who will go nameless, placed a phone call to one of our clients and said, you may, you may want to hire a lawyer and look at this. You're not getting all your royalties. And this is how Gordon and I crafted a theory to challenge well-established state law. I'll give you a hint. When the code was adopted by Napoleon in 1800, there would have been no possibility that man-made activities could have caused the loss of wetlands. Natural processes, yes, we're familiar with those. Hurricanes, storms, floods, tidal waves, whatever. But we submit that in no way was it the intent when the article was adopted by Napoleon's Congress that it would apply to man-made activities. So as we began our research, after driving to Baton Rouge and meeting with the State Mineral Board and the Attorney General's many attorneys, and we proposed a compromise to an obviously unhealthy situation that the public has no idea that the state of Louisiana is claiming private lands. And by the way, the Thibodeaux have to still pay their taxes every year on property that the state's getting their royalties because the state doesn't sue to get it. It's not like an expropriation process where you're served with papers and you have due process and you go to court and a jury decides how much money you're going to get if they're going to run a highway through your property. None of that happens. It happens by, you ready for this? Operation of law. Magic. Magic. And we submit there's a much too cozy relationship between oil companies who drill the well, survey the property, and then tell the state who's going to get the money. And the landowner is left out of this loop. So it raises the question, why should the state actively try to save the coastal wetlands if it profits from the minerals from land loss? Which is why you'll see the cover of our paper designed by my son Andy Perrin shows how the state of Louisiana is shrinking and the treasury of the state getting larger. I have notes here from a panel discussion. Garrett Graves, Senator Cassidy, participated in what's called the Market-Based Solutions to Louisiana, the Pelican Institute report on January 21st, 2014. This is Senator Kennedy's position as reported in this report. Louisiana should capitalize on private land loss and focus on mineral rights near the shore and increase developments of royalties on areas 
which used to be land and are becoming state-owned water bottoms. Senator Cassidy stated that the state does better when we lose land as the mineral rights then revert to the state treasury. Whereas, if the land is rebuilt, that goes to the private owner. He suggests that if the state were picking sites where to rebuild and restore losses, he suggested it should be on public, not private lands. So, when we launched this lawsuit, we reached out to the members of the legislature of Louisiana, who represent the districts along the coast, and we asked them to consider legislation to draft remedies to address this problem. And we submit there's absolutely no solution to this problem, and it'll get worse as more efforts are placed in coastal restoration. Gordon. Thank you, Warren. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Gordon Shuffler. Uh, as Liz told you earlier, I'm a, an attorney in private practice here in Lafayette. I've been practicing for about 13 years, and I, uh, I have been a, a student of water bottoms since childhood. I grew up hunting, fishing, camping all over the wetlands of South Louisiana with my father, Harold Shuffler, who's in the audience uh, today. Um, when I went to law school, this became a natural progression for me. I, I just, I've always had a love of the environment <clears throat> and uh, everything about it that, that we live with today. Uh, long story short is, is this, I have been involved in uh, controversies on both sides of this fight. Uh, there's been a fight, as Mr. Perrin put it, between the public and the private interests all over the coast of Louisiana. I've represented the fishermen who have fought for their rights to go and fish in the areas, and I've, in this case, represented the landowners who are fighting over the loss of their land. Um, you have to understand, uh, you've heard a lot uh, earlier today, I sat here and I watched the beautiful presentations from the artists and the musical folks, and then I saw uh, these two gentlemen that spoke before us today talking about policy. Uh, our perspective is that of an adversarial perspective. Everything that we deal with results, it results from disputes. So when we look at the, the issues going on in coastal Louisiana, uh, we have the, the scope of there being a, a lawsuit or a dispute of some nature and, and form. Um, I'm going to start by, for you to understand what went on in our case, you kind of need to have a, a basic working knowledge of water bottoms law in Louisiana. Uh, there are multiple, multiple sources of law for Louisiana as far as what governs our waters and our navigable waters and our non-navigable waters. You know, such sources would include Louisiana property law, uh, federal uh, laws such as the Rivers and Harbors Act, which deals with navigation, the Clean Water Act, which deals with pollution in, in our waterways, uh, federal admiralty law. Uh, that is a special section of, of our law that is, that is separate and distinct from everything, but Louisiana being the home to some of the grandest navigable waters in the nation is also the home to quite a bit of admiralty law uh, disputes. Uh, lastly, you've got other things such as the Commerce Clause of our Constitution, which imposes a federal navigational servitude. Um, Louisiana, as Mr. Perrin pointed out, we are unique in that we are uh, living under our civil code, uh, uh, and that's a statewide system. Now, uh, we also live under the federal common law because we are in the United States of America. We have what's called a dual jurisdictional status. Um, you got to understand that the Napoleonic Code that Louisiana lives under was born out of the French Revolution. Uh, and it was basically written by merchant class individuals that were in, intent and uh, their goal was to keep everything in commerce as, as often and as, as, as far as you could go. That meant land and water. They, they, wanted it, they didn't want anything to become useless in our society. Uh, the idea of, of maintaining public ownership of waterways in, in the French mind and in our French code is based on keeping it open for commerce. Uh, under United States law, which is birthed out of the English common law, uh, 
uh, which were, the English common law provided that um, all waterways belonged in the crown. And uh, American law adopted that in as much as that our waterways, at least under American law, belongs in the sovereign, We're not underneath a crown anymore. But um, in, in quick, uh, I'll give you a quick rundown on what all this means, uh, both from the Louisiana state and from the federal side. Louisiana law basically says this, if you're on a river or a bayou, the landowners own up to the low water mark of, of that waterway. The, the state owns, up, owns the bed of the bayou up to the low water mark. If you're on a lake or a bay uh, or the territorial sea of Louisiana, the state owns up to the ordinary high water mark. Um, there are quite a, few, <laughs> quite a few disputes that arise over whether a body of water is a lake or a river. And, uh, and you've seen that throughout the jurisprudence in this state. Uh, my, my family, uh, my mother's family uh, had one of the seminal cases on that very issue. Uh, a lot of times what happens is the court will draw an arbitrary line where they think a lake ceases to be a lake and becomes a river, and, and vice versa. Now, um, <clears throat> from the federal side, the, the main interest that you'll see from the federal side is this. Federal government want, imposes a, a natural navigable servitude on all navigable waters to, to keep interstate trade open in the United States. That applies to our what was deemed our brown waters, meaning our inland waters, and our blue waters, which would be our, our high seas and our gulf and our oceans that surround this country. Um, what you've just heard from me, and obviously this was a crash course, uh, but what you've just heard from me is uh, about everything that I ever learned in my law school class about water bottoms law in Louisiana. I'm going to venture to tell you what you've heard from me I actually expanded a little further on what I heard uh, or what I was taught. Uh, the majority of judges and lawyers in this state, uh, many of whom are our legislators, don't have much more of an education on water bottoms law than you've just received here from me. So when we sit here and we talk about policy and we talk about these issues, you know, the, the trouble that you're going to face in, in a lot of these public policy issues is this public versus private fight over who owns what and who gets what. Now, um, I'll tell you this, at this point when you ask the question of where does coastal erosion fit into all this, this whole quagmire of Louisiana water bottoms law, the answer is nobody knows. Uh, bottom line, there have been efforts by the legislature, by the courts everywhere to try and address these issues, but nobody really knows. We are, we are in a state of limbo right now, and the state is literally washing away while we, while we wonder what to do about it from a legal perspective. You know, landowners are losing land, fishermen are gaining water bottoms. Uh, you inject oil money into the equation and you inject uh, coastal restoration by the billions of dollars being uh, put into that, into that situation and it is ripe for conflict. Uh, and which leads us to the case that we're here to talk to you guys about today. We were, uh, we were hired by Warren's uh, distant family, whatever it may be. I still don't know what the official connection is there, but uh, we would call them the, the Thibodeau family. Uh, they owned a piece of property that was on the shoreline of Vermilion Bay. Uh, if any of you are familiar with Sippermore Point or in these places, Sippermore Point is a peninsula in Vermilion Bay these folks' land would be on the west coast of that bay, directly west of Sippermore Point. Um, Louisiana law is pretty clear. I don't know what I need to do to get out of this. All right. Louisiana law is pretty clear that the state owns up to the ordinary high water mark of, uh, of a lake or a bay, as I said earlier. Now, what happens when Oops. What happens when you've got 
I don't know if everyone's going to be able to see this or not, but uh, you'll, you'll get the gist of it in just a second. <clears throat> what happens when those bay lines move? Uh, in this particular case, as Mr. Perrin said earlier, uh, our clients were under the impression that they were the owners of 240 acres out on Vermilion Bay. Uh, a large oil well was, was spotted and turned out to be successful and people started getting paid on the percentage of ownership that they had in that well, which is dictated by the surface ownership that you've got. Uh, well, the family comes to find out that 40 acres has washed away uh, and, and in, our, in our understanding, it has washed away since, since the 1930s. Um, these folks come to find out that they are 40 acres shy, and, and that 40 acres amounted to quite a, quite a substantial sum of money, uh, which prompted them to come to us. Now, the state law is clear. Once it washes away and it becomes a part of a bay, it does become the state's. The case law that is out there uh, interpreting this civil code that I just referred to uh, a second ago always kind of points to the idea that look it's got to be a natural and a navigable I mean a natural and a uh, imperceptible change in the shoreline that's occasioned by mother nature uh, no one has ever tested the issue of what happens if we show that it is man-made loss um, I'm not one that espouses to any particular uh, cause as to coastal erosion. I, I believe that, that coastal erosion is a, uh, a death of a thousand cuts, so to say. Um, I think that some of the most uh, important things that happened to this particular shoreline uh, was, was the massive shell dredging that occurred in Vermilion Bay. Uh, beginning in the 1930s. Uh, it was curtailed in the 1980s through the efforts of environmental groups. Um, but, but on top of that, if you see this red line, straight line going across the top there, that is the intercoastal canal that was dredged through there. I believe completion in our area was probably in the mid to late 40s. Uh, there are a myriad of oil field canals that run through here. And then there's a, a large section of marshland just to the west of here that is, has been cordoned off uh, for agricultural purposes, is maintained as a freshwater marsh. Um, all of these things, in my mind, uh, have, have lent, lent to the idea that this coastline is not washing away as a result of Mother Nature. Now, another reason that, uh, that I say this, too, is, is that we've, we've had people, we hired people to look into this thing. Uh, one of them, a GIS expert, uh, had drawn this map up for us, and it shows the depiction of the land loss over time. If you look at the, the dark red line there, that was the shoreline as of 1930. That was when they first started flying aerial photographs uh, you know, first time we started having planes in the sky regularly. But that area from the, the dark red area depicts the land loss from, I, can't, I believe it's from 1930 to 1935, maybe later. The pink area behind it goes from uh, 35 to 40, and it, it goes so on and so forth. The line, line gets fuzzier as you get closer to the uh, to the, the interior of the property. But as you can see, it's been a change over time. Uh, the, the other map that I wanted to show you guys was an overlay of a Tobin map. Now it's hard to really see, but this, was a, this is an overlay of the original surveys that the US Geological Survey had done uh, roughly back in the, in the 1800s, probably, probably the 1840s or so. Uh, if you see this line here, this is what the, the, uh, the surveyors found to be the line, the shoreline back in the, at that time frame. When we overlaid this on the 1930 aerials, the shoreline had not moved an inch. As far as we could tell, it actually may have grown a little. Starting in the 30s, this area, this line here, shows the beginning of the washing away of the property. So we believe, and we, we took the position that look, this is not 
slow and imperceptible changes of Mother Nature. This is a man-made uh, affront to our coastal wetlands. And should the state enjoy the benefits of it? Now, a little secret about shell dredging, which I believe was the massive cause of the loss of this land. Shell dredging, the state was paid for the shells that were dredged from those bays. They received, um, I forgot, I don't know what they were paid per the, for the bucket load. Or it was, they got paid by the yard for shells that were pulled. They were told when that was going on by the environmental groups, you're going to cause erosion in this area. And so they were eventually sued to the point that they had to stop in the early 90s. Uh, but bottom line is this, they knew they were creating a problem back then, and now they're benefiting from the very problem that they created. And uh, anyway, we're at a point in the case right now, we're trying to reach an amicable resolution with the state on it. Uh, I can't get into the, too much of the details of the case, but, but all told, uh, when you guys are looking at the policies that are going to be involved in this whole process, you need to understand there are forces at play on the surface that, that are going to probably be the largest hurdles to coastal restoration or addressing these issues at all. Um, that said, I thank you all for having us. If you all have any questions, feel free to come meet me afterwards. Well, we have a couple of minutes for questions in this session. Um, so I, I guess before the presenters go completely back to their seats, um, do those from the session want to come up quickly? Uh, does anybody have any questions for them? Um, this is a question for Scott Hemmerling. Um, I was just wondering if you can explain why aquifers can only be recharged by rainfall in specific areas? A lot of that's just based on the geology of the area. A lot of it's just relying on the geology of the area where you have kind of the sloping geology so the, it, if it recharges up in the northwest, that's where that portion of the aquifer of that geological unit reaches the ground surface so it recharges up there and then with that slope that's a that's a short answer I think that's where we need to get into kind of the, the more localized studies because the, a lot of the data on agriculture doesn't take into account that dual cropping where you have crawfish which is dual cropped with the rice and kind of the one thing it does is it, it extends the season out so when we start looking at seasonality issues but there's also issues with the quality of the water as they drain out but right now there's no at least at a statewide level, there might be some very localized studies on that, but right now the most of the crawfish farming is probably included with the rice farming as that kind of as rice in the USGS data. I want to ask Gordon and Warren uh, if one office benefits from coastal erosion and other offices charge is to restore the coast uh how does how does that play out uh, into interoffice politics and in which office has more power and 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 how is that going to work that's, that's a question with no answer sir <laughs> I, I, I really you, you you see you see the dilemma that's that's created here i mean we are we are in a state of limbo with with all of this i, I really you bring a great point i, I really <laughs> It would, it would be interesting to find out. I, I do know that uh, it was interesting to see how the state ended up opting to go for this tract of land uh, in this particular case. Um, that's all I can say about it, though. And that was a decision made at the mineral board level. There's also a little problem 
with the Louisiana Constitution, which Article 1, Section 4B1 says that the state shall not take private property without due process and fair compensation and full compensation. So you have a constitution which seems to be in direct conflict with the Napoleonic Civil Code article, and so therein lies another dilemma. It, uh, as I mentioned, how unjust it is that the Thibodeaux are still required to pay property taxes on property the state is claiming. And on many of these maps, the state land office takes the position that on their maps they will note this property is being claimed by private land ownership and the state of Louisiana. So as Gordon says, there's no answer. Okay, we're going to go to our last question here. I'm curious, if, I'm curious if anybody has actually done any analysis of areas that are targeted for master plan restoration that are state owned versus private property that's targeted for master plan restoration. I don't know if that was directed towards the, the public policy, uh, Mr. Gordon here, but I, I will say this in our in our particular case, uh, the, the, this was of real interest to us was the uh, the fact. Uh, if you're familiar with the territories, Sycamore Point to Southwest Pass used to have a natural oyster reef that ran the whole length all the way out there. And then uh, if you're familiar with Marsh Island and over to the east point of Fur Islands, uh, there was a whole natural system of shell reefs that, that ran between those. And uh, those were the very reefs that were dredged and I believe created the situation where you have this massive erosion. Uh, one of the coastal master plan elements that I saw, at least when we started the case, I haven't seen it in the most recent elements, but uh, this would have been back in 2012. They had a plan to do underwater jetties that were gonna run from Southwest Pass to Sycamore Point, and one from the east side of Marsh Island back to the Point of Fur Chains. And the idea was to mimic the historic shell pads that were there. Uh, it, it would be something, I think, kind of an underwater jetty as far as I understood it. But, but that was, I guess, if you look at it, that was, that was an attempt to use what were clearly public lands uh, with this coastal master plan, to, and it obviously would have a benefit for, for those on the private side who claim ownership of land around the bay. All right. Um, at this time, we are out of time for this session. Uh, so please thank me, or join me in thanking our presenters for their wonderful presentation. Thank you.